All right, we made it. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me and thank you for coming. Uh, I have to say I'm a little disappointed that it was colder in Juneau when I left this morning than it is here. This is my first time to Fairbanks in winter and I expected a little more, but uh, I'm enjoying the heat wave. So uh, what I wanna do today is talk to you about um, changes in glaciers and ice field and basically how those uh, changes that we're seeing in the ice fields are impacting downstream ecosystems. And I'd like to start off just by acknowledging that a lot of the work that I'm gonna be talking about today has been done with a, a wide range of collaborators at UAS, the Forest Service, Alaska Coastal Rainforest Center, a whole variety of institutions. So I'm kind of representing a lot of uh, stuff that big groups of us have been working on to get at this question. So I'd like to start off just by, this is a uh, diagram that a group of us came up with recently that, that looks at what are the ecosystem services that glaciers provide. And we can kind of categorize these in a number of areas, provisions, which would be things like uh, food supply in terms of fisheries, supporting agriculture, um, cultural amenities such as tourism and recreation, and then regulating uh, ecosystems. And that would be things like water quality, uh, outburst floods, hazards, and things of that nature. And so what I'd like to do is just kind of give you some examples from each of these areas of things that we see in coastal Alaska that are impacts that changing glaciers are having on these ecosystems. Now when I started this work back 10 years ago or so, we started with a really basic question, which is just, well, how much water is actually running from uh, the land here along the Gulf of Alaska uh, into the, the marine ecosystems in the Gulf of Alaska. So what this map is showing is this is the drainage basin that drains into the Gulf of Alaska. This is the Yukon drainage basin here, which is twice the size of the Gulf of Alaska drainage basin. And then just for scale, here's the Mississippi River drainage basin, which is seven times as big. And so we looked at the meteorological data and uh, calculated the amount of fresh water that's discharging into the ocean and it turns out that there's a tremendous amount of runoff coming into the Gulf of Alaska. There's about four times as much discharge into the Gulf of Alaska so that's 870 cubic kilometers of water so if you think of a box that's a kilometer by a kilometer by a kilometer and filled out with water it's a lot of water discharging into the Gulf it's probably four times the Yukon discharge and roughly twice the discharge of the Mississippi River. And of that, it turns out that about 50% of that is derived directly from glaciers. And so this is glacier runoff that's being discharged into the ocean. And this is really important for a variety of reasons that I'll talk to you about. And it's also important because we know that glaciers in Alaska are changing pretty rapidly. And so here's a, a map. Some of you may be familiar with this work by Chris Larson and others looking at how glaciers are changing uh, along the Gulf. And you can see here the mass balance. So if you're looking at yellows and reds, what you're seeing is that the glaciers are shrinking in up to you know, four plus meters per year in low areas. And if you have blues, that's the glaciers are maintaining their balance or maybe even increasing in some cases. And so overall, there's about 90% about or more of the glaciers in coastal Alaska are shrinking and losing mass. And this is true if you look across all classes of glaciers. So we can look at glaciers that terminate on land, glaciers that terminate in lakes or tidewater glaciers, which we'll talk about today. And so if we add all three of these together, we get about minus 75 gigatons per year, which is 75 cubic kilometers of water excess that is the lost volume, you know, these, the, the volume lost from these glaciers. And that's important at a global scale because Glaciers in Alaska are really one of the bigger contributors to global sea level rise, and we can see that from these kinds of analyses. Here's an example, a recent study from the Juneau Ice Field, uh, which is where I'm doing a lot of my work. And so the Juneau Ice Field is about 4,000 kilometers squared, roughly. Uh, the ice thicknesses on the Taku Glacier exceed 1,000 meters in some places. And so here's kind of the current day uh, map of the Juneau Ice Field. And then if we project forward to the end of the century, we can see the projection is that the Juneau Ice Field will lose about two thirds of its mass and two thirds of its surface area by the end of the century. And so you can really see a very different landscape around Juneau and one that's far less 
dominated by glaciers. And so it's important for us to understand from an ecosystem perspective, what are the services that glaciers are providing these ecosystems that may be lost or alternatively, what are some of the um, opportunities that may arise from changes in these glaciers? Uh, where Juno is. Uh, well, Juno, the, the university is right here. Downtown Juno is like off the map right here. Um, it's hard to tell because the glaciers are gone. So I lose my, there's Berners Bay, which is just north of, of town. Okay, so this video that I have is a collaboration with the Extreme Ice Survey in Boulder, Colorado. And we have two cameras out at uh, Mendenhall Glacier. And these cameras are taking a picture every hour of every day, and then they get stitched together in a time lapse. And what I want you to notice at this is one, you can see the velocity, the rate at which the ice is moving forward, being delivered to the terminus, even though the glacier itself is retreating. And two, the rate of thinning that uh, Mendenhall, oh, I missed there somehow. Let's see, try that again. There we go. So we now have a decade record of uh, thinning and retreat at Mendenhall Glacier. So it really gives you a sense of how dynamic the system is. You can also see that we're going to need to relocate the camera pretty soon as we get to the end of the, the decade here. And again, that you notice the deflation or just the thinning, which is really how glaciers are losing a lot of their mass in Alaska. You better get there quick or you'll miss it. And then sort of backfilling here gives you a sense of, again, just how much, and that's one decade. Okay, so that's a really nice visual record, and you can see the impacts of this just looking around the landscape. So as you fly around, you know, up Lynn Canal from Juneau, you can see all kinds of valleys where you see trim lines where the glaciers are thinning, and, and there are very few places on Earth where you can stand on a glacier and have a mature forest above you that's retreating, that's moving down slope and reoccupying the area that's becoming uh, deglaciated and it's very warm here so we're losing ice rapidly and we're seeing landscape change and so valleys that look like this decades ago are looking like this where the forest has reoccupied the area that has been you know where these glaciers have been lost and so one of the questions that I'm particularly interested in is the links these rivers are kind of the conduits between the up, up uh, the glaciers and ice fields and the marine ecosystems downstream. And so it's important for us to understand, well, what are the fundamental differences between rivers that are receiving runoff from glaciers versus rivers that are receiving runoff uh, from forested ecosystems that are very different. And so I'll just give you a few examples here. One is just stream flow or discharge. And so this plot is showing stream flow on the y-axis. And so the green plot here is runoff from a bunch of forested streams, just a long-term average. And so what you see in terms of timing is that there's a small peak associated with snowmelt, and then after that, it becomes very stochastic, and it basically depends whether or not you have rainfall. And so you have this very pulse delivery of water in these smaller coastal streams. In contrast, the glacier river's discharge looks very much like uh, air temperature, right? It gets warmer in the summer and it cools down again in the fall. And so we see this very deterministic pattern. And from an ecosystem perspective, if you are adapted to this downstream, you have one sort of deterministic pattern where no matter the weather, is it cool, is it warm, is it wet, et cetera, you're always gonna fill the river with glacier water. In this case, if you have very little rainfall or a lot of rainfall, you're gonna have very dramatic swings in the amount of water that's available to those downstream ecosystems. The physical properties of these systems are also very different. And so here, what I'm showing are uh, a series of watersheds that have either more glacier coverage in the watershed or uh, less or even no glacier cover in the watershed. And so this is a plot of stream temperature, an annual plot 
uh, of kind of weekly measurements. And so what you can see with the glacierized streams that are in blue here is that they really are unresponsive to air temperature in the summer months, whereas the streams with little or no glacier are pretty responsive to the air temperature. And so you see this upward trajectory in uh, water temperature. And so it's a very different sort of physical setting in those systems depending on how much glacier you have present in the watershed. Similarly, for turbidity, which is a measure of water clarity, and that's important uh, in terms of light penetration, which influences primary productivity in aquatic ecosystems, you have uh, the glacierized streams in blue have very high levels of turbidity because of all the ground up rock flour from the glacier, whereas the, uh, the non-glacierized streams have very low levels of turbidity, so relatively clear water. So again, some, some pronounced physical differences that are, as you're going to see, are going to influence uh, the stream ecosystems themselves. Okay, this is a plot. Uh, uh, it's a stream temperature duration plot. And this is from 10 streams around the Juneau area, again, that have a range of glacierization. And so the streams that you see at the bottom here are uh, all heavily glaciated. And then as you go to the top, these streams are either, these top two have no glaciers at all. And then we have some sort of intermediate streams there. And so what this plot essentially shows you is that in the heavily glacierized rivers, for the whole year, they spend 100% of their time less than 5 degrees C. Whereas if you're looking at a small, low elevation, rain-fed stream, you have uh, periods of time when the temperature can you know, be above 15 degrees and even up close to 20 degrees, depending on the air temperature. And so this, uh, the, these dotted lines here are marking the optimal thermal range for sockeye salmon. And so it doesn't mean that they can't live outside of that range, but if you wanted to grow sockeye salmon, you would want the temperature to be somewhere in this range. And so when you look at this plot in that context, what it shows you is that uh, we have both challenge and opportunity here. Because if we go to the bottom of the plot, we have a lot of rivers that right now are colder than you would want to produce salmon. And so as the climate warms and the glaciers recede, these will shift up into this more sort of ideal area. On the other end of the spectrum, if you go up to the top here, we already have low elevation coastal streams that are pushing up against the top end of that sort of ideal temperature spectrum. And this again is northern southeast Alaska. So if you go down to Prince of Wales, places like that, where it's a little warmer and you have a more low elevation streams, you're gonna find more streams that are pushing up in here. And so one of the things that we have going for us is that we have a lot of thermal heterogeneity, which we think is important in terms of uh, adaptability and resilience for supporting salmon populations. Okay, so one of, the, one of my main interests is in the chemistry of glacier runoff. And so here's a picture of collecting a water sample right at the outflow of the Mendenhall Glacier. And it's important to collect the water at the outflow because we don't want it to mix with any other water. We want to know, you know, what's the initial sort of signal or chemistry, chemical fingerprint of the water when it comes out from underneath the glacier. And we've done a lot of sampling of streams, you know, both on the top of the glacier, these supraglacial streams and different glacier outflows. And one of the really interesting things that has come to light in the last really two decades now is that uh, originally glaciers were thought of as sort of inert blocks of ice that were sitting there melting and sort of almost like an, an icy desert. But what we can see now is people have done a lot of sampling both under the glacier and on top of the glacier and it is a really vibrant ecosystem in terms of the microbial ecology. And so these are all electron micrographs of um, microbes that are living at the bottom of a glacier in the Arctic. And we can see that in the chemistry. We see the fingerprint of, gla of microbes that are reworking and transforming elements coming out. And so in this context, we think about glaciers more as ecosystems than sort of these inert uh, blocks of ice. So I'll just give you uh, one example of chemistry here. And this is a plot. So SRP is soluble reactive phosphorus. Phosphorus is a limiting nutrient for primary productivity in many aquatic ecosystems. And we have the same kind of sort of uh, scheme here where zero is a watershed with no glacier. 
and 25% glacier and 55% heavily glaciated. And so what this plot tells you is per area of watershed, you'll get more kilograms of phosphorus out if you're in a heavily glacierized system than if you're in a non-glacierized system, particularly during the months when the glacier runoff is at a peak. And this makes sense because phosphorus is a rock-derived element, right? There's no uh, appreciable a uh, atmospheric source of phosphorus, and glaciers are very good at grinding up rocks. And so we can see that glacier runoff could be a potentially important source of phosphorus if that's limiting either in freshwater systems downstream or in uh, nearshore marine ecosystems. Another rock-derived uh, element that glaciers are thought to be an important source of is iron. And so uh, many marine ecosystems, especially as you go more offshore, are what are called high nutrient, low chlorophyll, which means there's enough nutrients to support primary productivity, but there's typically a lack of some micronutrient, which is in a lot of cases, uh, the limiting micronutrient is iron. And so the glacier rivers deliver this crushed up rock in these sediment plumes out here, and that can be a source of uh, dissolved iron. We also have cases where the sediments settle, but then they're resuspended during storms. So you basically stir up these sediments, and that's another opportunity to solubilize uh, some of this iron. And then finally, uh, glaciers also contribute through dust storms, because some of these, during the winter time, you have these strong outflow winds, and there's all this glacier flour sitting around in these river valleys, and that can be blown out into the Gulf, where it can help provide iron to these marine ecosystems. So in terms of, uh, you know, among other things, glaciers can be really important source of some of these rock-derived elements. Okay, freshwater uh, food web. So this is, uh, this uh, photograph is showing some of the different watersheds where we've done a lot of the studies around Juneau. And again, uh, it's a little dark here, but basically the university is right uh, down over here. and. So I'm going to talk in particular about Cowie Creek, which is out here at the very end of the uh, Juneau Road as you drive to the north. Um, and the, the fact that we have different amounts of glaciers in these gives us an ability to kind of look and see how things might change in the future. And, and one of the questions we're asking is, well, here we are at Cowie Creek. We're looking from the glacier down into the watershed. And you know, from, from a food web perspective in the watershed, does it matter that this glacier is here or not? And you know, it's an interesting question and one that we need to understand to see how these food webs might change as these relatively small glaciers that are in Cowie Creek disappear over time. So from sort of a broad brush perspective, we basically have three uh, generic types of streams in Southeast Alaska. One is a glacier stream, which is dominated by that turbid glacial runoff. We have clear water streams, which are dominated by snowmelt from higher elevations. And then we have the lower elevation, kind of uh, low relief, what we call brown water, because they tend to have a lot of musk eggs in them. And so you leach out from the peat, that sort of tea colored water. Uh, and those are rain dominated systems. And so what we have now is long term data sets that tell us um, a great deal about how the physical and the chemical characteristics of these types of watersheds uh, vary. And that's important because if we look at a place like Cowie Creek, and so here's an outline of Cowie Creek watershed, and what it's showing you is if you go to the south facing slopes, you have that kind of brown water rain fed streams. On the north facing slopes, you have some snow melt dominated streams. And then in the upper part of the basin, we have glacier streams. So we have a real habitat mosaic within the watershed. And so we can evaluate the sort of value of that habitat mosaic from an ecosystem services uh, perspective. And so we have used a, a food web, and I'm just showing a, a, a food web model. I'm showing a simplified version of that here. But the basic idea is that you have organic matter from vegetation. You also have organic matter from biofilms and algae. And this supports invertebrates, which in turn support uh, fish growth in these uh, watersheds. And so we can use the, what we know about the chemical and physical, physical characteristics as drivers to run this model and basically at the end of it kind of look at the potential to support uh, fish growth. And so this is kind of a, the sort of end point of the model exercise is to look at growth potential. So this is for 
juvenile coho salmon, and so it's grams per grams per day. And basically what it shows you is anytime you're above the dotted line, you have positive growth potential. If you're below it, you're actually in a scenario where you have less resources, so you're sort of in the, the starvation negative growth potential. And so for each of these stream types, you can see that there are differences in the amount of resources that theoretically should be available based on what we plugged into the model. So, and for uh, you know, one interesting point is that glacier streams, which tend to have a lot of groundwater, actually turn on and become more productive earlier in the spring when the other two stream types are less productive, but they don't really have, the, they're pretty cold all summer. And so you see the productivity from a fish standpoint, it's too cold and you're not really gonna get a lot of productivity there. And so if you look at the total growth for a year, you say, well, if the fish hung out in a glacier stream, it wouldn't grow very much, a clear water a little more, it should definitely go in the rain fed stream. But the alternative is that fish are mobile consumers and they have the ability to move throughout the habitat and make use of different sort of provisions in the habitat at different times of year. And so in that scenario, if you used this, this kind of model system in Cowie Creek, you could actually get up to 50% more growth if you moved around and took advantage of the uh, availability of invertebrates or whatever it is at different times in different types of habitats. And that's kind of an idea that we're exploring to see, well, maybe these, uh, you know, the glacier systems, if you just looked at it on its own, you'd say, well, it's not important. But in combination with these other streams, maybe it is actually important. So basically the idea is here, if you look at, here's a, the intersection, here's a glacier river and a, a rain dominated river coming together here. And so we know that the, the physical chemistry, so the physical and chemical differences between these are pretty well defined. Those are gonna drive differences in resources if we look at biofilm, if we look at invertebrates, and then ultimately we can use those to tell us something about the fish capacity. And the nice thing about this model is that we now have some hypotheses that the model has spit out that we can go out and test on the ground by sampling food webs in these different kinds of streams to explore this idea of the habitat mosaic. Okay, in addition to influencing rivers, uh, the physical removal of the glaciers from the landscape is also uh, creating opportunities for salmon. And so here is a map of Glacier Bay. So Juno's just right over here. We come around to Glacier Bay. If you go back to late 1700s, there was a glacier right down into the edge of Icy Strait here. And so the entire bay was ice covered. And the glacier has since, you know, the Tidewater Glacier has split up and retreated back into the east and west arms, tens of kilometers um, over the last uh, several hundred years. And if you, you can see here is about the 1860, I sort of roughly marked where the ice was at some different time periods. And so if you look in the lower bay, it's greened up and there are all kinds of streams that have come out from under the ice. And so I'm gonna show you some pictures from a number of streams that are in the upper bay here that have emerged relatively recently from under the ice. So places like Nunatak Creek, Vivid Lake Stream, and Gull Creek, um, you know, several of these are less than 50 years old. That if you went back there 50 years ago, the stream was physically covered with glacier ice. And so you can see how quickly they develop. And if you walk the stream, it's an incredibly productive stream. And all of these streams now support salmon because although salmon go back to their natal stream, a certain percentage of them stray, which allows them on sub-decadal timescales to repopulate these new streams that are emerging from underneath the glacier. And so the kind of initial estimate is roughly 500 new salmon streams along the coast of Southeast Alaska that um, because of the recession of glaciers over the last several hundred years, and we're actually working uh, on a project now to try to map this sort of forward in time and be able to predict, okay, if glaciers continue to recede, how many uh, new salmon streams are we going to get uh, along the coast of Southeast Alaska? Okay, if we move uh, from the streams down into the marine ecosystems, this is a picture of Berners Bay, just north of Juneau. And so we can see this big glacier plume that is coming from the Gilkey and Antler glaciers up here down the river. And so again, the idea is that this is providing a certain uh, chemistry and structure to these uh, 
marine ecosystems. Now, one way that we can map the sort of extent of this glacier influence is to use water isotopes. So you, you're actually looking at the water molecule itself at the isotopic signature. And in this plot here, what you're looking at is if you see sort of reddish colors, that means you're looking at the isotopic sh signature of ocean water. And if you look at bluish colors, you're looking at the isotopic signature of fresh water. So this is Prince William Sound. And what you can see is that the fjords that are, have a lot of glacier and snowmelt runoff, the surface uh, signature is that they are dominated by fresh water at the surface. And in fact, if you look at, in, in many cases, this is visually evident because you can see the sediment. But even in places where you can't see the sediment, you can use the isotopes to see that fresh water and you can also see it in the chemistry as well. And oftentimes, you can see the signature uh, 10 kilometers or more away from these glaciers of where that glacier water is coming out uh, into marine ecosystems. Okay, so how does this, uh, you know, how does this structure these marine ecosystems? And one thing that's been interesting in talking with people who are ecologists working on nearshore marine ecosystems is uh, how much productivity there is up close to some of the glaciers. And so this is a map of Glacier Bay here. And so if you go up the west arm or up the east arm, you're into the sort of heavily glacierized areas of the bay. And then you get the sort of greener area down here by the Beardsleys and the Visitor Center. And so this map, so this is for Kit Kitlitz's Mirilets, which is kind of an ice associated bird. And you can see there's a high density of them up here by in these heavily glacierized areas, in addition to some other areas uh, in the lower bay. If you look at capelin, which are an important uh, forage fish, uh, cold water spawners, again, you see some hot spots right up in these really turbid cold waters where people traditionally would say, you know, there really shouldn't be much productivity in those waters, but yet you find these uh, fish there. And then krill, uh, you know, again, really pronounced hot spots in the trawls, and these are mostly from surface trawls up in the upper reaches of the bay that are dominated uh, by this glacier runoff. And so that's surprising and it also tells us that there's something there that is increasing the productivity and sustaining these, uh, you know, sort of aggregations of uh, prey species or in this case, uh, plunge feeding seabirds. Okay, so one example of a, a model, uh, a modeling effort to kind of look at this, we can use isotopes. You can take a sample from uh, any of these animals that I've been mentioning here, and you can basically look at the carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen, nitrogen isotopes in the sample, and you can use a mixing model that allows you to deduce where the resources that the animal is utilizing are derived from. And so in this case, uh, we separated out uh, organic matter that was derived from rivers, so it's basically coming off the land into the ocean, and then uh, productivity that was due, that was from the coastal ecosystem itself, or offshore productivity that was sort of mixed into the coastal system. And so using this mixing model, I'm just providing one example here of the Kitlitz's Mirillet. What this tells you is that the proportion of its diet, the highest proportion is derived from this riverine material, a lot of which is, is coming out of the glaciers. And so, you know, more than 40% of the diet is, from, is derived from this material that's moving from the land down in the ocean. So that gives us an idea potentially of the importance of glaciers. It's not surprising because these birds are really ice associated. They like to nest right next to glaciers. They like to feed uh, right next to glaciers. And so it makes sense that the runoff that is coming out of there would be supplying a good portion of their diet. Okay, so tidewater glaciers are kind of a, a specialized, you know, uh, I would say an endangered species of glacier in Alaska. Um, and the, the fjords that tidewater glaciers uh, that have tidewater glaciers have some really unique um, characteristics. Now, if we look uh, throughout Alaska, there are 36 tidewater glaciers remaining in the state, uh, down from 50 in 1975. So in the last 40 years, we've lost more than a quarter of the tidewater glaciers in the state where they just retreated out of the ocean and they're now sitting on land. So these tidewater glaciers are shown here in the, in the dark colors and basically range from 
um, Petersburg down here, Leconte, all the way up to some of the Tidewater glaciers in uh, Prince William Sound. And the, the really sort of interesting uh, pattern that you see in these tidewater fjords, and there's, there's a number of different circulation patterns, but this is a kind of uh, idealized one that I think highlights a lot of what's unique about these fjords. And the idea is that the fresh water, instead of being discharged in a lens on top, which you'd get from a land terminating glacier, the, the discharge is coming from underneath the glacier, the fresh water is buoyant, it rises up and entrains warm uh, ocean water so it adds to melt at the glacier face. It also entrains organisms like krill and, and they can be killed by the osmotic shock from exposure to the fresh water. They're brought to the surface. The other thing that upwelling does is it brings up uh, nutrients to the surface as well and so it increases the productivity and oftentimes if you go into these tidewater glaciers you'll see a lot of you know uh, plunge feeding seabirds that are aggregated in these areas because of all the material that's being brought up by that upwelling and this sort of convection loop uh, circulation that you have in fjords uh, that have tidewater glaciers but that's absent from fjords that are getting runoff from land terminating glaciers Okay, an interesting study that was done recently in Greenland. So here's uh, the, all these fjords in uh, Western Greenland. I think they studied 42 fjords and the ones in blue are fjords that have uh, tidewater glaciers. The ones in red are, have land terminating glaciers. And what they found, halibut uh, fishing is the primary uh, sort of economic engine of the fishing industry in Greenland. So they're very interested in the halibut catch. And they found that there was actually a correlation between the amount of runoff from marine terminating or tidewater glaciers and the halibut catch. If you look at the same plot with the runoff from land terminating glaciers, there's no correlation. And so um, what was interesting is that if you looked at the average catch per kilometer squared for the, the fjords that are in blue with the, with the tidewater glaciers, it was eight times as high on average as the ones with the land terminating glaciers. And the authors of this article were speculating that that had to do with the upwelling and the sort of increased productivity that you see associated uh, with tidewater glaciers. Okay, in addition to uh, that circulation, tidewater glaciers are also important uh, for providing habitat. And so the icebergs that calve off the tidewater glaciers provide uh, haul outs for harbor seals. They also provide areas where they can, for pupping, and raising their young that are safe uh, environments for them, you know, from orcas and other uh, predators. And so this is uh, evident. This is a, a study that was done relatively recently where um, 37 female harbor seals were tagged or radio collared in, or actually fitted with GPSs, as you can see here, uh, in Glacier Bay. And so during the non-breeding season, you can see that these seals were going to Prince William Sound, they're going out onto the outer coast, they're going all the way up Lynn Canal, they're sort of going all over the place. Although this heat map, as you see the reds is the areas where they spend more time, yellow is where they spend less time. So they're still sort of centered in Glacier Bay, but they're really spread out. If you advance forward into the breeding season in May and June, what you see is they become much more concentrated in Glacier Bay, and in particular, uh, Johns Hopkins Inlet, which has a tidewater glacier, was kind of a focal point of where these seals wanted to be during that time of the year. And what they found is that of the 37 seals that they tagged, 93% uh, of them returned every year for the breeding season to Glacier Bay. So there's really high site fidelity. And that was, uh, one of the hypotheses for that was that, well, this is an area where they have access to uh, tidewater glaciers there in sort of a protected uh, area. Okay, and the other uh, ecosystem benefit is uh, that tidewater glaciers are really good for tourism. And you know, we've talked to a lot of sort of land managers and tour operators, and one thing that they always ask is they wanna know, you know, if I stand in a certain place or I take a boat to a certain place, how long will I be able to see a glacier from that place? Because it turns out if you can see a glacier, you can sell a package to go to that place for a lot more money. And if you can see a tidewater glacier, then you can sell a seat on your boat for even a lot more money. Because interacting with a, oops, 
oops, going out, there we go. Uh, interact, you know, tidewater glacier is much more interactive. You see calving, you see seabirds, you see all this activity going on at the glacier face. Once that glacier comes out of the ocean and is sitting up on the land and is more static, then in terms of being able to package that as a tour, you're not going to be able to get uh, the same amount of return. And so the, if you think about you know, tourism as a $4 billion industry in Alaska, and Tidewater Glaciers are a really important uh, part of that. Okay, I want to finish up by mentioning uh, an example of glacier hazards that are sort of climate driven. So we're going back to Juneau here. This is Mendenhall Glacier. And here is Mendenhall Lake, and this is uh, high altitude aerial photography from the late 1970s. And this glacier right here is the Suicide Glacier, and it flows down, and it was a tributary glacier to Mendenhall. And what has happened at Suicide is that the glacier has retreated back and is now perched sort of up on a cliff here. And so this is if you climb up on that cliff. Let's see if I can get this to play. This is what you'd see. So you're looking down from the Suicide Glacier towards uh, the Mendenhall. So that's a main Mendenhall Glacier. There's the Suicide, the current terminus. It used to go down this cliff and then through this basin and join the Mendenhall Glacier. And so if you look at this from the other side. So now we're standing over, well, actually an helicopter right above Mendenhall. So there we're looking up at suicide. And uh, this is the suicide basin, which is over deepened. And what happens now is that this is detached. And there's, uh, this is just old remnant ice that's kind of melting away over time. And so the meltwater from the suicide glacier comes down. It fills this basin, and the main Mendenhall acts as a dam. And so we have a scenario where we regularly have outburst floods because the water fills up underneath that. So you'll see that sort of rise up. It'll push against the main glacier. When there's enough hydrostatic pressure, it will drain out uh, underneath the main glacier. So one more video here. So this is a time lapse video. The USGS put in a, a time lapse camera at our study site there. See if I can go up here and over. It's like the left hand hand eye coordination is very challenging. Um, okay, so what you're going to see, there's one photo a day from last summer. And you'll see the basin fill and then drain, fill and drain. It kind of looks like it's breathing. And so those are, those are glacier outburst floods. And if you watch, and you also see the ice thinning away later in the summer. And so if you looked very carefully, you would have seen five glacier outburst floods. And if you went down to the Mendenhall River downstream and you looked at the stream flow at the USGS stream gauge there, you would see that indeed there were five glacier outburst floods. And there's a bunch of rain floods as well, but you can tell there's a very distinct signature with these where they, what happens is that drainage hole, because of the friction of the water running through, it's getting larger and larger. So it's like if you pulled the plug in your bathtub and as it drained, the drain got bigger. So what you have is a really steep descending limb on the hydrograph that characterizes these, which is different from what you see after a rainstorm where the drop off is not as steep. And so last summer we had these five small events. We didn't have any real big events, but looking to the past, you know, we didn't have anything over about 7,000 CFS. But some of the bigger events that we've had in the past were in excess of 16 to 18,000 uh, cubic feet per second. And so this is a, a, from 2014. So here's a kind of, we have a little station there where we're monitoring the level of the basin filling up. And so there's the ice that's floating at this point. That's looking up towards Suicide Basin. And there's Jamie Pierce, who works for USGS, at our monitoring site. And so basically, we can watch this thing fill up. And you know, when it got to this level, it was like, yeah, we knew we were going to have a huge flood out of that because we'd never seen uh, that level of fill before. And it's challenging because as the amount of ice in, in the basin melts, the same fill level is a different volume in the lake. So you sort of have to keep trying to recalculate it every year. So here's a video that I shot underneath. Uh, I had to actually evade the police who are on the bridge and did not want me to go down there. But uh, so I got a video underneath the bridge during the main 
part of the flood there. So this is about probably 17,000 cubic feet per second running down Mendenhall. So there's more water in Mendenhall than in the Grand Canyon uh, right now. And it, it was really impressive. Thankfully, there was very little damage uh, from some of those bigger floods. And, uh, you know, basically there was some flooding in some of the houses around the uh, glacier. If you look downstream, people's yards are filled up, their yards are eroding away. There was some areas in the campground and the trail access roads that were flooded and they had to close those off, but really no major damage uh, to infrastructure at all. So this is um, a phenomenon that we're trying to study uh, more and really just understand some of the dynamics of it because it's, it's, it's interesting that some years we have a bunch of small floods and some years we have one or two uh, very big floods, but it's definitely something that has the potential to impact really the main sort of residential area of Juneau. All right, well, I'm gonna just close by sort of making a pitch for uh, systems thinking with regard to ice fields and glaciers. And that is this idea that we need to think of these coastal ecosystems as extending all the way from the ice field to the ocean and try to study these as one big linked ecosystem because what we understand now and by studying these in sort of interdisciplinary groups is that the changes that we see on the ice field are propagating to rivers which in turn are propagating downstream and that has a whole variety of impacts you know many of which we've talked about in terms of chemistry and food webs and even the Alaska coastal current is density driven and so as you change the amount of fresh water discharging in the ocean that could change the strength of the coastal current and we have you know fjord mixing and all so all these things are are linked together and in the past what happened is we had glaciologists up here studying and we had someone studying in the stream and someone was out here in a boat and they were all doing their own thing and what we're trying to do now is get people to work together and say okay hey i'm going to sample the river at this time so you know that here and then downstream can we coordinate with when you're sampling out here so that we can tell a story that extends across the whole ice field to ocean rather than just have all these sort of disparate pieces that people are off working on their own parts. Okay, for those of you that are interested, uh, I'll just point out a couple of resources. Uh, two of these are review articles, so they're really accessible for anyone with sort of a general background. One is in the May 2015 issue of Bioscience, and then we wrote uh, a more recent one about glacier impacts on downstream ecosystems, and that's in the September 27, uh, 2017 issue of Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And then uh, lastly, the Alaska Climate Science Center on their website has a sort of fact sheet, uh, kind of general public oriented uh, ice field to ocean uh, thing that we put together just to kind of help people understand it at a, you know, sort of basic level what we're trying to do with this project studying from the ice field down to the ocean. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge the funding for this research, uh, in particular, Alaska EPSCOR and the Alaska Climate Science Center have been very supportive of the sort of interdisciplinary efforts that is taken to do a lot of this work. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.